Great. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm uh, Parisa Naruzi. I'm uh, the director of Empower DC. And this is a workshop where we're going to learn about grant funding opportunities, particularly to boost the lo local work around environmental justice. Um, but some of the opportunities are also um, will support other issues as well. Um, the video that I just played was a short recap of the Environmental Justice Action Summit that we held a couple months ago. Um, it's the first annual, so we are intending to do that uh, annually. And we also made a commitment to hold workshops um, on a regular basis, again, to foster support for the local EJ movement. We're doing that in part because um, Empower DC is very committed to environmental justice. Um, you may be familiar with some of the work that we're doing around air quality and heat island effect and um, the over concentration of industrial sites is particularly in, in Ward 5, um, trying to shut down NEP, a chemical facility in Ivy City. Uh, but we also serve as the lead organization of the DC Environmental Justice Coalition. Um, and we welcome you and, and your organization if you're interested to um, let us know to, to find out more about that. And we're also serving as the DC lead for a program called TICTAC stands for uh, Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. Michelle's gonna speak to it a little bit more, but in short, we are helping to play a role of connecting local organizers and organizations to some technical assistance that might include air quality monitoring, it might include um, you know, mapping and, and things like that, but it also includes funding. <laughs> so that's why in part we're having this um, workshop today. Um, so what I'm going to do is ask if you wouldn't mind to go ahead and, um, and introduce yourself in the chat and you can just put your name, pronouns and organization. And if you wouldn't mind, you could just mention, is there a project that you're working on that you're seeking funding for or, you know, some other sort of reason why um, you were compelled to come here today? That would be really helpful just so that we get a sense of who's in the room. And then we'll also have this video to share with folks who were out uh, out and about this morning and, and couldn't join us online. Um, I'm really grateful that we have two presenters today. Um, Michelle Kokolis, who's with the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center, and she'll speak to their role, but they're playing a really important role in the Tic Tac that I just mentioned in particular with this, you know, helping people connect to funding opportunities. Um, and um, and then Brigitte Roussan, who's a longtime friend and somebody that we just consider part of the family. Um, she is one of the initial founders of the Diverse City Fund, which is an incredible resource here locally. It's been such a pleasure to see it grow and, and just blossom into this really strong um, base of support for local organizing. And it has a really low barrier um, entry process. So we, I wanted to give both because the federal funds are challenging <laughs> to to uh, get. And if you're at an earlier stage, you um, may be a great candidate for diversity fund. Um, so with that, if we could again have people introduce themselves in the chat, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. Um, and just again, name um, if you can do pronouns and or, or rename yourself um, and uh, organization and if there's a project. But We'll continue to look for that. And the way we're going to run the agenda, we're going to have Michelle speak and she has a, some slides she's prepared. We'll give a few minutes for question and answer after that, but we'll hold a lot of the question and answer until after we also hear from Bridget. Um, we have scheduled this to go until 2, 1230. However, we may or may not need all of that time. So when the questions and, and discussion are over, we'll end it. Um, and with that, welcome the folks who have just joined, and we're going to go ahead and turn it over um, to Michelle. Great, thank you. Um, share. All right, is everyone seeing my slides? I am not seeing. Not them. yet. There we there go. go. How about okay. now? <laughs> now we see them, yes. Okay. All right, great, thank you. Um, all right, so thanks, Parisa, for having me. Happy to be here. Um, my name is Michelle Kokolis. I am a program manager at the Environmental Finance Center at the University of Maryland. Um, today, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of who we are and what we do. I'm going to talk about the Tic Tac program a little bit, and then I'm going to uh, talk about one specific oppor opportunity that is currently available. 
So for those of you that aren't familiar with us, um, the Environmental Finance Center at the University of Maryland, um, we are one of a multitude of centers across the country. Um, the only one in Region 3, so we serve all of EPA Region 3, meaning basically all of the Bay States, um, including the parts that are not in the Bay. So Maryland, Virginia, the District of Columbia, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Um, we So we work throughout the Mid-Atlantic, and our goal and role is really to provide information, tools, and resources to help build community capacity um, to pay for resource protection and restoration priorities. And you can use the word community in whatever context you want. We work on the state level, the local level, county level, and with individual HOAs, municipalities, um, nonprofit organizations. So community meaning anything. Uh, we have three main roles that we fill. Um, the first is capacity building and training. So we offer um, local government leadership training. We do a lot of hands-on virtual workshops. We also have something called the Municipal Online Stormwater Training C Center, which is um, a series of courses and case stories online that you can take and view. We do a lot of policy al analysis and financial assessment, um, policy review, financing strategies, uh, budget analysis, as well as program evaluation. And then we also do a lot of community outreach and facil facilitation, which is something that I do a lot of personally. And this can be anything from designing outreach campaigns for an HOA or a municipality, um, facilitating stakeholder engagement. We conduct focus groups, um, manage community surveys and interview and everything under the community outreach and facilitation bucket. So the situation right now, um, as Parisa mentioned, there's a lot of money that's available through the federal government. Um, there's money coming from the bipartisan infrastructure law or the bill. That's $1.2 trillion um, focused primarily on infrastructure and jobs. It, it's available through 350 programs that are managed over 12 agencies and is typically coming in the forms of grants and loans. There's another pot of federal money that's available through the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA. That's an additional $370 billion. And that money is focused primarily on clean energy and jobs. It encompasses over a hundred more programs and it comes in the forms of grants, loans, rebates, and incentives. So as you can see, there's a lot of money that's available. There's also a lot of programs and a lot of agencies involved, and it really is a lot for any entity, large or small, to sort through and figure out what, what makes sense, what's applicable, and how to apply for it. And so that's something that we have been focusing on a lot lately. So the challenge is um, how do you navigate these programs? They have competing timelines. They're hard to find the notices for sometimes. Uh, for a lot of organizations, prioritizing needs is very challenging. Um, once you figure out if you wanna go after something, um, proposal development can be a challenge for a lot of folks. These are not short, simple, easy applications to complete. Um, there's the question of managing the money if you receive it. Um, in some cases, you know, loan payback requirements. And then with all of this funding, there's a lot of procurement and reporting requirements because they are federal dollars. And so one of the roles that we're serving throughout the region is helping um, community-based organizations, NGOs, and other entities navigate this federal funding system. And that brings us to the TICTAC program, um, Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. So this is a program that was started by the EPA um, in April of 2023. And the goal of it is to provide grant funding to establish technical assistance centers nationwide to provide technical assistance, training, and related support to environmental justice communities. So these centers are across the country. We happen to be the one here in region three. Uh, the team here, the main team is the National Wildlife Federation is who was the primary recipient. And then we're working with them as well as the University of Maryland Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health, also known as SIEGE. If you're familiar with Dr. Wilson, that is his program. 
So how does TikTac work? Um, there is a group of core partners that serve as hubs in each of the regions, and their role is to ensure that services are easily accessible, both in location and culture. Um, Empower DC is one of the hubs in EPA Region 3. So the community hubs in our region um, include Appalachian Voices, the Centro de Apoyo Familiar, um, Empower DC, Overbrook Environment Ed Education Center, Sentinels of Eastern Shore Health, South Baltimore Community Land Trust, and the Sussex Health and Environmental Network. The two that I highlighted there in blue are the two that are local to the DC region. And then there's also three HBCU hubs that are working on this program, and those are Morgan State, Virginia State, and West Virginia State University. And as Parisa mentioned, the role of these hubs is really to help get this information out to the other CBOs in the areas and connect them with one another. Our role at the Environmental Finance Center is initially to provide the hubs with the technical support and capacity building that they need so that they can then take on that larger role with connecting and assisting the other CBOs in their areas. The objectives of TICTAC are to provide outreach to underserved, underburdened, rural and capacity strained communities through technical assistance with the goal of increasing their capacity to assess environmental and energy justice concerns, obtain funding, and engage policymakers and government agencies to invoke change. Um, the technical assistance opportunities through this program include what we're calling wayfinding. In other words, how do you use grants.gov? How do you register in sams.gov? Um, how do you find these applications? We're providing training on grants administration. So everything from writing the proposal to managing the grant once you receive it, as well as capacity building and organizational growth and partnership development. And those last two are important because a lot of these federal dollars come in large pots of money and they're gonna involve capacity building and or organizational growth if you receive them. And a lot of them also require partnerships. And so we're here to help connect entities to get together to form partnerships that are going to create um, impactful and lasting results in their communities. If you're interested in participating in the TIC-TAC program and becoming one of the organizations that can receive assistance through the Environmental Finance Center, SIEGE, NWF, as well as Empower DC, there is a pretty strict um, intake process that you have to go through. And that's what you see here. There's a website that you go to, you, the website's listed at the bottom of the slide, you click on get started. It's gonna take you to an intake survey that you're gonna complete. Once you complete that, there's a couple other forms that, you, that you'll need to complete as well before you're eligible for assistance. Um, you can also scan the QR code here and that will take you directly to the same um, intake survey on the NWF website. Once you've completed all of those steps, then your information will be assessed to figure out what you need and you'll be connected with the appropriate technical assistance provider, which most likely initially is going to be us at the University of Maryland. Once you're in the TIC-TAC system, there's a lot of different th things that are provided to you. The one I wanted to highlight um, is specific to funding because we are here to talk about funding today. So one of the things that we're doing at the University of Maryland is managing this grants database. And so what you see here is a screen grab of the database and we are tracking all of the opportunities that come uh, become avail available across a host of different categories that are related to um, in anything related to environmental justice issues, energy, um, climate, stormwater management, tree planting, community development, capacity build, building. So we, we're basically going through all of the announcements that come out and curating a list for the people that are part of this program so that you don't have to spend your time doing that. You can just go into this database and say, oh, I'm looking for something that has to deal with trees. Is there anything that's open? Um, so this is the database view and then we have another view that folks can see. If you find a program that you're interested in, you can click on it and it's gonna show you all of the information that you really need to know before you decide whether or not this opportunity is a good fit. 
So it's going to tell you um, when the uh, application period opens, going to give you the name of the program, a link to the website, who the funder is, what the focus areas are, um, really important who the eligible applicants are, because not all of this funding is available to every type of entity, whether or not you have to provide any match, how much funding is available, what the award period is, um, what kind of application it is. So if you have to complete it online, if it's a pre-application, if it's a full application, and other resources that would be of interest to you. So everything you need to make a decision is right here and that including the link to the actual website if you want to apply. And so that's just one of the tools that's gonna to be available to you if you come into the Tic Tac program. The specific funding opportunity that um, Parisa asked me to talk about today is the EPA Community Change Grant. Some of you may already be familiar with this. This is a massive funding opportunity that's open until November. Um, it's been open for not quite a year now. Um, the purpose of the community change grants are to provide resources for community-driven projects to address environmental and climate changes, um, climate challenges, again, in EJ communities, communities facing disproportionate and adverse health pollution, adverse health pollution and environmental impacts, um, and suffering from generations of disinvestment. That's the, the primary goal of the community change grants. Um, they're also investing in strong cross-sectoral collaboration. So again, they want to see partnerships within the community. Um, the, this is an opportunity to unlock access to additional and more significant resources to advance your environmental and climate justice goals. Um, there's a lot of money for capacity building within this program. And then again, to strengthen community participation in the government decision-making process. So this is a, an all-encompassing opportunity. There's two main tracks to this program. Track one is, is what's referred to as community-driven investments for change. These are very large awards. The award amount is the, a minimum of $10 million and a maximum of $20 million. You cannot apply for less than 10 and you cannot apply for more than 20. And that is each award. Um, the purpose of track one is for climate action and pollution reduction strategies that improve environmental, climate, and resilience conditions affecting disadvantaged communities. Track two is meaningful engagement for equitable governance. These awards are smaller, but they're still they're still very large, especially for small organizations. They are one to three million dollars each, a minimum of one, a maximum of three. And the purpose of track two is to facilitate the engagement of disadvantaged communities and in, in the governmental process to advance environmental and climate justice. Those are very high level overviews. I'm going to talk about them on a very high level just to give you an idea. In terms of the timeline for this program, they are accepting submissions on a rolling basis through November 21st. A rolling basis is always nice because you have a little extra time to get things prepared. And the EPA will is supposed to be reviewing applications on approximately a monthly basis. So um, submissions are on a rolling basis and the announcement of funding will be on a rolling basis. Uh, they originally said that the first reviews were going to happen in February with the first awards being announced in March or April, and then the first set of projects set to begin in May or June. Uh, they've not done that yet, so they're a little behind on the timeline, which is also not surprising. Um, all of the projects must be completed within three years, and this is really important for this program. There are no extensions being offered. A lot of times you can come back to a funder and say, oh, we need a little extra time. It took longer to do this or that. Can we get an extension? In this case, they are not offering any extensions. So any money that you don't spend within your three-year timeline is just going to go away. Um, and the lead applicant can submit a maximum of two proposals under this program. I want to talk about the eligibility because there's some very specific requirements for this program. The first of which is you have to have a partnership. A single entity cannot apply. In addition to having a partnership, one of the partners must be a community-based organization. Um, the eligible applicants 
So our partnerships of at least two community-based organizations or a partnership between a community-based organization and either a tribe, a local government, or an institution of higher education. You can have more than two people in your proposal, but you have to have at least two partners in, in your proposal. Submission to the Community Change Grants is through grants.gov. Um, some of you may be familiar and registered with that already. You do have to register in grants.gov. You can't just go and submit. Um, in order to submit through grants.gov, you also have to register through sam.gov. And the sam.gov registration process creates what's called a unique entity ID or a UEI. So, and registering through sam.sam.gov will generate your UEI. If you haven't already done those two things, you have to do them before you can even view the application in grants.gov. So if you're thinking about this program, um, you need to, if you're not already registered, you need to do that first. It's not a quick and easy process. It's not really complicated, but it involves some paperwork that you have to have and a fair amount of information. So it is something that takes time. You're not going to be able to do it in just five minutes. So you need to budget for that registration process in your proposal timeline. I also wanted to cover a couple other important things to consider, consider while you're thinking about whether or not a community change, change grant might make sense for you. The first is, are you registered with grants.gov and sam.gov? The second is, can you meet the timeline? Um, these proposals are very large. The notice is 90 plus pages long. Um, they involve a lot of writing, a lot of plan development, and they require a lot of documentation. So for those of you that have done proposals in the past, and you're used to maybe like a six page narrative and a budget and um, maybe a couple letters of support, this is not the case here. Um, it's not something that you can start two weeks or even a month before it's due. So if you think that you might be interested in a community change grant, I would strongly suggest you get started on it as soon as possible. Uh, the second question is, do you have the capacity to manage this large amount of money? Um, as I said, you cannot apply for less than the minimum amount. So it's either a minimum of a million dollars or a minimum of $10 million. Awards of the size come with a lot of reporting auditing and financial implications. So especially for small organizations, you know, th think about do you have the capacity or could you get the capacity to manage this large amount of money? And are you prepared for the financial implications of that? If you receive more than $750,000 of federal funding in one year, it kicks you into a different class of audit, into a different class of reporting. And so there are some financial implications. The um, next thing is, do you know who your partners would be? As I said, there are specific partner eligibility requirements, one of which is a formal partnership agreement that has to be completed. They give you um, a template that you can use or you can create your own. But again, this is much more structured than the grants that most people are used to where maybe you get a letter of support from your partner, um, and that's it. This is a very formal structured process. Um, and quite honestly, it might not be the best opportunity to take a new partnership with no history for a test drive because it's a lot of money. It's a long period of time um, with a lot of requirements attached to it. That said, if you have a primary partner you would want to work with and maybe you're bringing in some partners, some smaller partners you haven't worked with before that would take a lesser role, I think that that's perfectly okay. Um, but I don't know that it's the best opportunity to sign on to a new partner for a $10 million grant that, you, that you've never worked with before. So just some things to consider about this opportunity. The last thing I wanted to do is just give you an idea of what the types of things covered in each of these tracks are. So track one, community-driven investments for change. Again, these are 10 to $20 million awards, and they're anticipating making 150 of them throughout the country. The goals of track one are to increase community resilience, reduce local pollution, center meaningful community engagement, build community strength, 
reach priority populations, and maximize integration across projects. Within track one, there are some required elements. So in addition to your normal project, the narrative that you're gonna have to write, which I think is limited to 10 pages, I believe, you're also going to have to include all six of these elements. You have to include a climate action strategy, a pollution reduction strategy, a community engagement and collaborative governance plan, which is 10 pages long, a community strength plan, which is five pages long, a readiness approach, and a compliance plan, which is an additional five pages. So this is where I was saying there's a lot of additional writing you have to do for this proposal beyond your normal um, project narrative and timeline. And these are not optional. You have to do all of them. In track two, meaningful engagement for equitable governance. Again, these are one to $3 million awards. They're looking to make 20 of them across the country. So track two is a little more competitive than track one. The goals of track two are to build capacity of communities to have a meaningful voice, to support direct community participation in the development of in development and implementation of solutions, policies, and programs, to break down systemic barriers to community participation, create two-way engagement and feedback, inform communities about issues, and develop mechanisms to ensure that community needs are being integrated into the government process and policies. So very different from track one. The last thing I wanted to give you were some resources. Um, we have developed proposal templates for both track one and track two. So if you enter the Tic Tac program, you will have access to those um, proposal templates. We also have recordings of some webinars that we have done on both track one and track two. This opportunity is unique in the sense that the EPA is also offering technical assistance, which is not something that they do on a regular basis. Um, and you can take EPA's technical assistance, even if you are working with the Tic Tac program. Um, their assistance includes assisting with developing, preparing, and submitting applications, um, developing maps and designs, permitting, uh, determining if, if your project is even a good fit for the proposal, helping you with your budget, uh, community outreach and engagement assistance, and then assistance developing partnerships and governance structures. We can also offer you all of those same things. The one thing I want to say about this is even if you are in the Tic Tac system or have gone are going to go into the Tic Tac system and you want to work with us for this, I would still suggest you take advantage of the EPA's technical assistance. Um, for no other reason than it is always a good idea to have a conversation with a funder. They're going to be able to give you some insight that we cannot give you because they're the ones that will be reviewing the application. And it's also always a good idea to just get your project and your name on their radar so that when it is submitted, they're like, oh, we talked to this person that gives you a better feel with the funder. So, and I would say that for any type of funding, not just for the community change grant, always have a conversation with the funder prior to submitting, even prior to writing your proposal. Um, another entity that's offering um, resources related to community change grants is the Environmental Protection Network. They have some application guides as well. They have a series of webinars and example documents that they have made available that you can access through their website. I know there was a lot. Um, if there's time right now, I can take a couple questions. I'll also be here to take them at the end. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I just wanted to um, remind people, we put in the um, the chat, the link to the intake for the Tic Tac. Uh, again, if you're with any kind of organization that might want some kind of technical assistance for environmental justice work, I recommend you go ahead and fill it out. And then even if you're not with an organization, but you, um, you know, are a provider yourself, if you're an air quality expert or you know have some other type of technical assistance you can provide to people that is another um thing that you can do the intake for and then be in the system as well um, we'll take a couple questions and then hold the rest till after Brigitte. and that's why i wanted to uh have, make sure diversity fund was here as well because uh everywhere i go people are people are telling government people are telling us 
well, there's all this money from EPA, you should get the money, you know, and it's sort of like they act like it's some simple thing. And so, you know, Michelle giving us the real reality check. Um, I also wanted to mention that, you know, there are um, a lot of applications going in from academic institutions. And I had one um, reach out to us who was only wanting to offer us 25,000 a year out of this multi-million dollar grant um, to do community work. And I had to say to them, look, you know, community outreach and engagement is very labor intensive and it's very valuable to these projects. So it's actually really disturbing for me um, that, um, you know, somebody would be applying for 10 to $20 million and then only offering the community organizing group 25,000. Um, so, you know, again, I, I think to the extent that we can kind of be aware and intervene and, you know, make sure that people are utilizing the funds justly is meant to get to the grassroots. Of course, the EPA didn't set it up to get to the grassroots. So it kind of is, you know, very difficult. Um, Shane, I see your hand. You want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, morning Teresa. Good morning. A long time no see. Um, so my question is, um, so I'm an LLC, um, but a part of my services is workshop facilitation. So that falls under education. Um, so my question is, am I able to link with a community-based organization and apply for grants as an LLC? Um, generally speaking, yes. Um, for community change grants, yes, you could also be a part of those proposals. Um, you, as an LLC, are you... Are you a nonprofit? You're not a nonprofit as an LLC, right? So there... no, but I consider myself to be a social enterprise. But right. I don't know. I don't know how much that holds water on paper. You know what I mean? So it doesn't in terms of being the second applicant, but you could be a third or fourth or fifth partner in a community change grant proposal. Um, for these, both of the applicants need to be the the partner. The primary partnership needs to be either to, um. 50C13 CBOs or a CBO and local government or a school. But you could certainly certainly be a partner in the proposal. They would still just need to have another one. Um, generally speaking, for most applications, um you would it's it's hit or miss. You could always be a partner. Whether you could be a primary applicant or not would depend on the actual um, specifics of the funding opportunity. But yes, you could always be a par partner with another organization. So it would just have to be one organization, not two. For community change grant or just in general? Yes. Community change. For a community change grant, you could be written into 20 proposals, as long as the proposals have the other eligible applicants, right? So like, okay. if Empower is going to do a, a, a submission, and they have their other partners, so they meet the um, partnership requirement, and they wanted to include you as a third entity, great. And then if we were going to submit a proposal, and we have our other applicant, and we wanted to include you, great, you can, you can be a partner on as many proposals as you want. The primary mm -hmm. applicants can only submit two proposals. So Parisa could submit under track one and track two as the primary applicant, but that's it. She couldn't submit three applications through, gotcha. through Empower. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, and I'll just add that we're, you know, um, we're still figuring out if we have the capacity to submit as a primary applicant. Um, I'm hoping that we can. Um, we just recently beefed up our finance team so that we would have more support because again um you know there's a lot of financial uh, accounting and reporting and um mm -hmm. i think this one uh some of the epa grants are actually you you get reimbursed right you you pay out and then you invoice and get reimbursed this one i think is a little bit different but still very um you know lots of financial um accounting Paris um, is like, don't call me yet. I'm still figuring it out. Yeah, no, but but at the same time, I'm happy to hear what folks are interested in because whether it's under you know a proposal we put together or others that I'm hearing about, I can refer people to you. Um, so you know, feel free to message me directly or email me. Um, and if I'm getting you know inquiries, I can I can share them with you. Thank um, you. 
Yes. Is there one more question for Michelle before we move to Bridgette? If not, we will go ahead and, and flip the script to hear about <laughs> something with a lot less uh, <laughs> um, difficult, um, but the same, you know, great true intention. So I'm, I'm happy to have Bridgette join us from Diversity Fund. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Parisa. Thank you, Michelle. I'm really excited to be here. Um, okay. Uh, and I think you're not seeing my slides yet. Is that right? Right. It's saying. Okay. Give me one moment. I've been having trouble with my laptop, so I'm going to share from a different computer, but you will still hear me here. Well, oh, and Parisa, if you can make that one co-host. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yes. My... Bridgette too. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. Here we go. There we go. Okay. Technical issues are so much fun. Yes. The... We all get in a little panic. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Our systems are on Saturday mode. <laughs> Right. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Fortunately, it's been happening enough that I try to make sure I have backup. Okay, here we go. Yeah. All right. So yes, excited to be here. Parisa has been one of our stalwart supporters, partners, and uh, counselors, wise counselors over the years. And um I'm excited to know about some of the federal funds that are going to be flowing to us. But yes, if you're looking for more of a grassroots presentation of uh, grant opportunities, here's what we've got. Um, so DC Fund is participatory, community-led. We support work that is about racial and social justice. So environmental justice is definitely in um, in that rubric, and we want to realize liberation, spark solutions, and organize against oppression so that we can create uh, systemic change. These are some of the folks as a, who are a part of our backbone on uh, the board of instigators, and also we have um, actually four now paid uh, staff instigators. Uh, Tamira Benitez is our executive director and Elizabeth Tabebu is our programs manager. And those are often folks that you would talk to in the application process. So just wanted to make sure that you know they are there. Um, we are about redistributing wealth. <laughs> so we support, um, you know, getting money from foundations, um, other organizations that have more funds and wealthy individuals, as well as grassroots givers. And we are redistributing it to change makers of color. Um, we've had 26 grant rounds since we started in 2011, giving out grants. That's 783 plus grants. And I say the plus because some of those have come outside of the regular grant round. And now we're, um, yeah, and most recently we made $65,000 in rapid response grants to um, groups we'd already been supporting so that they could do advocacy and organizing around the DC budget. And you know that that can be a hot mess. So there's need there, especially in terms of environmental justice. So we've redistributed 4.32 million plus and, um, and counting, it's continuing because our, um, Grantees get the opportunity to submit for rolling grants up to $5,000 uh, between um, grant rounds that they're eligible to apply in. And these are some of the groups that we have supported that pay attention to environmental justice and health, food justice. And um, you can find out more about them by going to that wonderful QR code. Um, and I'll make sure that you all have access to these slides. So shout out DC Greens. Um, and I'm just so glad to hear about some of the groups that are here today to learn more. We fund um, BIPOC or global majority led groups with a focus on DC residents. So many of our funding partners 
uh, fund in the DMV, throughout the DMV, but we are DC only. So that focus has to be on DC, even though recognizing gentrification as it is, you don't necessarily have to live in DC. You may have been displaced. Um, but we want to amplify the leadership and voices of the people most directly affected by issues, by oppression, by policies. And we want um, to support groups that are taking action to create equitable outcomes. Um, so it's obviously not just about, you know, we're coming together and we got a liberation vibe or spirit. That's important. But the kind of work that you all are doing is what we want to look at. So transferring power and resources to directly affected communities, um, using strategies like power building that will tackle problems at the root and really engage the people affected in finding the solutions and creating the change. Our priorities are, um, again, work that is mobilizing people for direct action or doing advocacy or organizing some, in some ways, the advocacy um, focus, as you uh, might know, would be on policy change, administrative, you know, regulatory change. Um, you know, the way that the Department of Environment does its work implementing legislation that's already been passed, uh, budgetary change, um, legal change, which might be through litigation. So that's advocacy. And then the organizing is a lot about campaigns and building power and um, you know preparing groups with political education so that uh, change can be made. Healing justice is also a part of what we fund. And the idea is that that's oriented towards building sustainable movements. And obviously that's contrasted some to some of um, the more commercial capitalist notions of self-care. Um, self-care is important, but uh, it's, it's about sustainability for movements. And so people of color led, organized and doing uh, work primarily in um, and for DC communities of color. Um, uh, we want to, uh, we, we do have an eligibility per cycle that you can't have just received grants in the last cycle. So um, those groups that got funding in this spring are not eligible again until next spring. Um, thanks to the Compass Council, to hear from community that Parisa served on, we are prioritizing groups with a budget of $50,000 or less that are newer in their efforts. And some of those will be groups that have been doing social service in the past and are really making a pivot to social justice work, or that's a major part of what they're going to be doing going forward. And uh, we have some uh, additional uh, grant opportunities for grantees that we have supported over the long haul, and that's something the staff can give more information about. We don't fund direct service, we don't fund government agencies, we don't fund national organizations. There are some exceptions if it's a local chapter and really um, grassroots um, based in DC. And we don't fund businesses. So that would include like LLCs or uh, socially responsible businesses doing work. Root, um, root causes rather than symptoms is what we're looking at. And again, it could be um, work that is trying to uh, support, organize. It, it, it can be organizing, it can be advocacy, it can be contributing to narrative change. What are the ways that we talk about these issues and policies? What are terms that we're pushing for uh, policymakers and journalists and, and others to use, ordinary folks to use? Um, how are we building actual alternatives? So the, the way that people get um, their food, it, is it through uh, a cooperative? And are those cooperatives also looking at how, um, you know, other parts of the system change? 
And you can learn more uh, about what we mean by that by watching a, a YouTube video on our website. And I can put a link to that video in the chat shortly. The way we work is we have two grant rounds a year. Sorry, I'm trying to pay attention to my time. I've got another five minutes. Okay. Um, in the spring and in the fall, uh, we don't do a regular, a, a specific thematic focus. And that goes back to our very roots, which is that we want community groups to tell us what the funding is needed for, as opposed to saying, this is what you may apply for. Um, we used to have a maximum of $5,000 in grants. We're now um, $10,000 max for newer groups that are getting, you know, getting their footing and up to 25,000 for groups that have received funding from us in the past and have been doing this work for, um, you know, for a substantial amount of time. And so we do have review initially by the staff just for eligibility, and then our grant making team makes the decisions. What's new again this year is that we have three groups that we've identified um, in order to decide um, how much you're eligible for and what level of priority we're placing. So we, um, we try to give um, anywhere between 40 to 50% of our grant funding to um, group A, which is sprouting or seedling, so we, we really are doing our best to live into um, grassroots values. And we, um, we, we do the applications all online. Um, it, it's my understanding that you can get technical support and other kind of support ahead of time. And so you wanna actually contact the staff and um, by sending an email or calling and get that help if you need it. But all those applications will be online and they're accepted up until 11.59 p.m. on the day that they are due. But these are the elements of what you're going to be asked to respond to. And you do have the opportunity to set up an account and come back to that grant application time and again to complete it. So what's, um, who is involved with your group? What is your work? Who are you partnering with? Um, and, you know, how really does that work um, support uh, systemic change? Okay. These are key considerations, strong analysis of the issues, clear and thoughtful and community-led plan, fostering relationships that build community power, having the potential to create um, deeper enduring change in the system, in the culture, a history of organizing, mobilizing, or healing justice, um, and likely not to be funded by traditional groups or less likely to get substantial funding through traditional channels. So we are community-led, Grant making team is composed of activists and community leaders of color. It's not the board, it's not the staff, it's not the donors who make our decisions. This is the process. Um, we um, pay attention to having our grant making team come together around what those priorities are and, um, and get to know one another. We have facilitated retreats to make the decisions. And we open up for applications next on August 16th. The deadline is September 20th, again, 11.59 p.m. But we will have um, information sessions on all these dates. One of these, I believe August 31st is in person. The others are all virtual by Zoom. The grant making team meets in October and November, then funds are announced and dispersed in November. And, oh, sorry. Again, I will put this in the chat or maybe Parisa could do that for me, but, but I can do that. Um, so look out for the um, 
the emails that will come, um, email us, go on our website to join our list and you will be able to get um, alerts. But this is where you'll be able to go on our website to apply. And one of our, um, oh gosh, I kind of messed up this slide, y'all. One of um, the folks in our grantee survey said, DC Fund is the exact opposite of what I think of in philanthropy. They fund revolutionary change rather than inadvertently support the status quo. And we're really proud of that. And we continue to listen to folks to make sure that we are accountable around that. So again, I will put contact information and the how to apply link in the chat. And um, I know that Michelle and I are both open for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, yeah, such a great resource locally. Um, so I wanna open it up for um, Q&A as well as just discussion. I'm also really interested to hear from you all, You know, what are the biggest um, challenges that your effort is having around getting funding? Because uh, perhaps we can design some additional sessions to to support that. Um, you know, as somebody who you know co-founded an organization uh, almost 21 years ago this year, um, I know those hurdles of organizational development, and um, so I really appreciate you know the fact that um, it's not as simple as it might sound. Sometimes there's a lot of components that you know it's it's helpful sometimes to have um, support with. So. Uh, question, comment, discussion, um, what are the challenges that you've uh, faced or what, what kind of additional support would be helpful to you and your effort? And I see Shana's hand and I'm hoping to hear from a couple more folks as well. Go ahead, Shana. Okay, back in it again. So the question <laughs> is generally the same that I have for the other young lady. Uh -huh. um, am I good as an LLC for this criteria? Or do okay. I need to partner with community-based organizations? Yeah, so we do not fund LLCs uh -huh. and um, the funding would need to come to, for, through um, nonprofit uh, group. Uh -huh. okay. Some, a number of our um, grantees do not have C3 status. Um, they are a group, but they're not incorporated as a nonprofit and don't have tax exemption um, uh -huh. under the IRS, but they have to get a fiscal sponsor uh -huh. or somebody who will agree to pass through their funds. Uh -huh. And so it it's not as if your work can't be supported, but there has to be a not-for-profit effort that we're uh -huh. supporting. And it uh -huh. has to formally come through a not-for-profit vehicle. Does that okay. make sense? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Bridget, do you all have um, a resource list of groups that can um, serve as a fiscal sponsor? Because I know that's been one challenge is identifying fiscal sponsors. Yeah, it it has been a challenge. I'm happy to report two things on that front. Mm -hmm. One is that um, we are moving to become an independent 501c3 ourselves, as opposed to our being fiscally sponsored. Mm -hmm. And that will give us more leeway in who we um, make grants to. Um, however, we do always through our staff and our networks, try to help folks who need to find a fiscal sponsor, find someone. It's not necessarily formal matchmaking, but we always make sure to give um, at least one or two or more recommendations of groups that you can approach that we think will, um, you know, would might be willing to support you. Thanks for that question. Wonderful. Um, more questions, comments, discussion. I see Adrian put in the chat. And Adrian, do you want to go ahead and come off mute and um, elaborate? She says, I'm really interested in individual based funding for community programs, arts related. Um, I'm not sure if I know what individual based means. Does that mean like not an organization? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I want to be able to see, be able to see everybody. Um, how do I do that? <laughs> I, I don't know if you have the camera. If you can turn your camera on, or I'm I'm not sure what. Yeah, you know, I had it covered. Sorry. I had oh, it there covered. we go. Okay. <laughs> Yay! There she is. Hey. I um I have actually been called to um create um 
a community-based um, program where I want to teach our youth the childhood games that we used to play. <laughs> like these kids no longer, they don't know anything about, you know, childhood games fun, like one, two, three, red light, you know, and stuff like that, outside and inside, like the yarn games. And I've been reaching out to people. Uh, I was telling my daughter, I want to find like a couple of other women um, who would join me in this. So I'm, I'm still at that point. I'm at, totally at the beginning. Um, but I, I'm thinking that some funding for this would really be helpful. But again, I'm at the total beginning and I'm wondering, do I need to do an LLC? Do I need to create an LLC or... Or what? I, I don't know how to move forward. Um, God is just telling me I need to do this. So I don't yeah. know. How to do it. This has been in my spirit for about three years now. Yeah. Parisa, do you want to speak to that? And then I can chime in. Sure. Um, yeah, Adrian. I mean, I think that uh, that, you know, it's a particular situation that we might want to have a separate conversation to talk through. But what immediately comes to mind is um, seeing if there's an organization that exists that has, um, you know, a similar or like-minded um, kind of vision or mission or works with kids that you could propose this as a project under them and then, um, you know, with a budget so that either they would pay for it or you oh. would work with them to get funding mm -hmm. for it. Um, so, um, because, I mean, you could certainly, uh, you know, create a organization and I would say LLC, you're going to get, you know, maybe contract opportunities, but not grants, right? Okay. So you would need a, either a fiscal sponsor or become incorporated as a, as a nonprofit yourself to get grants. Um, but, you know, if you could really think a little bit more about the scope of the program and the cost, you know, what is the type of dollars that you're looking for? And then see, are there any uh, existing uh, programs that you think would fit well with this? I and, mean, you know, meaning, is there a community center that you could, you know, propose this to or a school or, you know, something like that? Um, I think that could be a good start. And I think incubating things like that, right? So not necessarily trying to go from zero to 100, but mm -hmm. you know, like a pilot, right? Like mm -hmm. testing, right. testing, test right. case. Mm -hmm. right. I would say a church would be another church thing to think right about. In. Yeah. I didn't hear that one. Most faith-based organizations are eligible for a lot of, of the funding that is out there. Well, I am actually scheduled to do some volunteering in this capacity with my sister's place. Oh, great. That's a I perfect was, one. Yeah, I was supposed to be there last weekend, but the heat, I couldn't do the heat because yeah. I'm on public transportation. I have asthma issues. So um, they understood. But but this right. is going to be something I'm going to be doing um, monthly with them. That sounds like a great way to build mm -hmm. out the program and maybe ultimately say to them, hey, can we turn this into a funded you know, program um, yeah. and then shop it around to others, too? That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Bridget, did you want to add anything? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with both Parisa and Michelle. And the only thing I would add is that um, crowdfunding can help you get started. And hmm. sometimes that can be a real um, plus when you go, when you approach either a faith based organization or, um, you know, or another type of, yeah, supporter, funder. That's okay. a great comment. And Brigitte, can you uh, just clarify what crowdfunding meaning? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I mean, like GoFundMe or one of those other platforms where you're reaching out to your networks and they're reaching out to their networks and they're saying, yeah, I'm in, I'll give you $25 or $100, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be able to point to that kind of support can be really um, encouraging for you, of course, but it also says to other people that might support you, okay, this is something that could be sustained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful information. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, additional comments, questions? I see one in the chat from Stacy. She says she'd like to see um, more examples of folks who received these types of funds to speak more about their process and help ease the mind of folks who might get overwhelmed with the process. Um, Michelle, it sounds like for the community change grant, they actually, there hasn't been any awards yet, so we don't know who's been successful in getting it. Um, I will say with um, the Tic Tac, 
uh, you know, we're a sub grantee, so we're not the one managing that grant, but I can tell you that it's been um, very difficult. And we have another partner who, um, again, this is for EPA funds. We have another partner who spoke to me about they're not going to apply for community change because they had a different grant <laughs> with EPA that uh, they ultimately pulled out of because it was it was too difficult to deal with EPA. So we are in this process of trying to leverage the funds, but we also need to address the inequities in the system of the way that they, um, you know, grant makes. Uh, Michelle, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I would just add to that that um, especially if you're new to the grant world, um, a federal grant is just probably not the best place to start because they are really cumbersome. They're annoying. They're a lot of work. Um, the federal funders aren't the easiest to deal with. Um, and so I would say look for something that's a little smaller to sort of get your feet wet. Also take advantage of technical assistance um, and work with the funders. They all offer webinars and guidance. Um, we offer guidance. Um, and a lot of the sources that we're putting into the um, funding tracker that I showed you, they're not all federal. A lot of them are smaller. They're more attainable for smaller organizations. They are, you know, it, under $500,000 a lot of the times. And so I would say think about like a smaller grant to get your feet wet and really see what the process is like. Um, because not all funders are made equal. Uh, we, I apply for fund, funding with a whole lot of different organizations. Um, and there are some that I love to work with and some that I hate to work with. Uh, so I would say start small would be my advice. And local, like small and something that's yeah, a little like, more local. Like Diverse City Fund is a great, if you're yeah. getting started with grants, Diverse City Fund is the way to, to do or, it. Or um, community foundations. Foundation. Um, and you know the, there's some other philanthropic stuff locally um if you're it, it depending on what you're looking at if you, you're looking at things that are more um environmentally and water focused district of columbia has a lot of grants chesapeake bay trust does a lot of smaller grants and they have grants as low as five thousand dollars and so there are options that, that are a better way to get your feet wet in the grants um, system than a federal opportunity. Thank you. And I see Estefania's um, hand, so I'm going to call on them, but also just quickly um, uh, a question from the chat. Does that database, uh, the grants database you're maintaining, does it have any opportunities listed that have a focus on children's health to your knowledge? Um, I don't know if there are any that are open now that are focused on children's health. I feel like we just added one focused on children's health, but that is one of the um, categories that we are searching for because some of the hubs are focused specifically on um, health related issues. So yes, that is something that goes into that tracker. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, correct me if I'm saying your name wrong, es Estefania. Uh, Estefania, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for this uh, workshop. It's been really helpful so far. Um, I had a specific question for Bridget about the Diverse City Fund. Um, you mentioned briefly um, in the presentation about organizations that um, have chapters. And so I just wanted to get a little more clarity on like the eligibility for that. Um, so I'm with Veggie Mijas and we do work in the intersection of food justice, social justice, and like environmental justice work. Um, and I am now trying to kind of get us more into the, the bridging us more into the environmental justice um, grants and just, you know, partnerships and things like that. So um, a few grants that we have applied to um, in the past, we haven't gotten funding because of the chapter specific situation. So I'm just wondering like what the requirements are for this one. Thank you for the work that you're doing. It sounds incredible. And um, yeah, we've specifically mentioned that there is that possibility, even though we don't generally fund national groups. And so I think it would be a conversation to have with the staff. And um, they tend to be very much in communication with the grant making team before, during, and after any grant round. And so when it gets into kind of some of the specifics of whether this would 
a be eligible and b be really compelling you know and 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 warrant they're making a decision to you know make an award they could say more about that but i know that it's about like how rooted is that organization is in the community um how much is it locally controlled right as well as oriented and um, you know, is it genuinely uh, BIPOC led? Those would be some key considerations, but definitely a great conversation to have with our staff. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, definitely will be applying. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Shana, I see your hand. And then if there's any other comments, questions, please either raise your hand or put something in the chat or come off, uh, come on camera so I can tell. You have something. Uh, Go ahead, Shana. Yes, I just wanted to ask Ms. Bridget. Um, you put something in the chat about brown, uh, two brown girls. Um, I work with Miss Aja Taylor at uh, Bread for the City. She trains me in under workshop facilitation and equity projects. So I just wanted to point that out. That's cool wow. that you put her in there as a reference. Thank you so much. Yes, she is. Amazing. And so yes, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And just yes, to, I put in the chat that um the Greater Washington Community Foundation is um going to relaunch their health equity fund, another grant round for that. I don't know any specifics at all, but I would definitely keep an eye on that. I don't know, Paris, if actually if you know more about what's going on around that. I know a little bit about it. I mean, we're we're a grantee of it from an earlier round that focused on policy and system change. I think some of the funds available right now are for um, demonstration projects, projects that are rooted in community and address health equity uh, and the racial wealth gap. So um, I know they've been focused a lot on um, things like guaranteed basic income or other policies that would help, um, you know, or programs like cooperatives and things that would help um, address health and wealth at the, at the same time. Um, but um, yeah, definitely look at the, at the, the links that were shared. And um, if there's somebody who needs a, an introduction, you know, to a program person to speak to them about that grant, um, let me know. I'm happy to help with that. Um, so yes, yeah, so please, please go ahead. All right, somebody unmuted. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, I wish I could show my face, but I'm in the car. Um, my name is Taylor A, and I really wanted to join today because I'm trying to figure out how I can, I guess, like get into this world. Um, I go to UMD. I have one more um, class, and then I'll have my master's of public health in environmental health science. Great. And Great. I do water quality, water testing. Um, but recently I just got um, a job and I'm in like a different industry in the water. But one of my clients is DC Water and I work with sewage and all these other things. But I live in DC and I really want to just like try to figure out what I can do because I do feel like environmental health is something um, that needs more focus. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. I, I just wanted to tell you guys that and maybe I can follow up with someone via email to try to figure out something I could do. Um, additionally, I do do black and white film photography and I tr try to capture like some of the environmental issues in DC areas where I'll see spillage or trash and things like that. So just more so brainstorming, but like, you know, trying to be proactive with, with some of the knowledge I have so I can assist. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful, Taylor Ray. So nice to meet you. Um, if you want to follow up with me, I'd be happy to talk to you about the DC Environmental Justice Coalition. And also, um, you know, a lot of our EJ work centered in the Ivy City community um, and in the Brentwood community, we have some water uh, related um, concerns and haven't really quite gotten um, all the support needed there. So perhaps um, we can work together on that. But thank you. That's great to hear. And let's see, was there any? Okay, Stacy had a comment. What what more could organizations do to to make sure there's equity in the funding uh, granting process? And I, I am guessing we're co you know connecting that more to the EPA federal. Michelle, is there anything that comes to mind, or have you heard anything that people are trying to do? Um, no. Um, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, 
it kind of is what it is. It's something that we provide feedback on to funders a lot. The fact that the way they put these announcements out, um, the length of them, the amount of work that it takes to get through them, and even things as simple as um, not putting multiple opportunities in one announcement, right? So like it, it, it's not as daunting if you're looking at 20 pages as opposed to 60 pages. We provide that um, information and feedback to, to the funders we work with all of the time. Um, the other thing is some funders have started doing surveys at the end, like um, the Chesapeake Bay Trust, for example, at, at the end of every application that you submit to them, there's a, a series of questions that they are now asking. They're not required, um, but the first series of questions is related to um, the demographics of your organization. And then the second series of questions is related to the actual application process. Um, and they are not just check a box questions. There are places that you can write. And so I would say, um, the number one thing would be if you do complete an application and then there is the opportunity to to take a survey like that, make sure that you do it. Um, I think I think that's another good thing that be, can be conveyed when you meet with a funder. Um, so like if you are going to apply for something and you have a call with the funder prior to writing or as you've started writing, which as I said, is always a good idea. Um, that's an opportunity to provide them feedback as well, right? Like, so, so one of the things I'm struggling with is I don't understand the way that this is phrased. Like it would be really helpful if you provided this type of information within the notice or, or whatever. Like e even if it's not a solicited opportunity to provide fun back, feedback anytime you're talking to a funder, give it. Um, otherwise that's really all that you can, can do. I, I know it's not super helpful, Stacey, and I know that you don't like that answer, but um, I think that um, just making your voice heard when you have the opportunity, they know, they know that they are cumbersome, um, but it's just the way that the, the nature of the beast because it's a federal federal machine and that's another one of the reasons i say don't start with a federal grant they're they're way more complicated mm -hmm. but sorry i don't have a better answer for you no that was fine no that that, that was fine I mean, and, and, and and obviously we know that there is a lot of pushback or just the slow movement um but it's great when we have the opportunity to hear about grant opportunities. And I've just loved the fact that everybody that's been on this panel has been very straightforward about the process that it will take to receive these funds. So I think if there's any insight that you all have to share with us in, in regards to how we can make that process move a little faster or make sure that equity in this um, you all are providing a great access to that. So thank you. I mean, look, I'm not going to lie. I think that they're horrible as well. I mean, like I struggle with them sometimes. We're working with communities right now, um, a couple communities that received earmarks and I'm helping them complete their online applications. And even I struggle with them sometimes. I'm like, what on earth does this question mean? So it's, and that's something that we're constantly telling these folks is like, if if we, the people who do this on a daily basis are str struggling with them, um, how do you expect the people that you want to be applying to be able to navigate them? Um, so we're working another, on Yeah, and another thing that's come up is, um, and Shakobi Wilson, who leads the Siege Center at University of Maryland, has been very outspoken about this, that this money is supposed to be for grassroots EJ work, but the institutions that are getting the grants are largely not grassroots EJ organizations. And so um, there was another funding program called the Grant Makers, um, where, um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of concern, especially for the, the group that got the grant, which is a bigger grant than Tic Tac. I think it was 18 million. And they're, they're going to be doing sub grants. So um, that's another thing to check into because they, they will, they will have a, they it may already be an open RFP and it's a funding opportunity. It's probably on Michelle's list as well. Um, but, uh, but the point being that there was a big meeting about this with EPA the other day, and it's, it's about this specific grant program, but it's 
getting at the larger issue. Like, is this money actually going where the feds said it was going to go, <laughs> you know? And, um, and like I mentioned, I'm having that same experience with the academic institutions who, you know, they also uh, command a very high overhead rate on these um, academic institutions and, you know, the community-based groups getting shortchanged. There's big money, but it's very little money when it gets to the grassroots, you know? Um, so yes, we're continuously speaking out about it, but I think um, using, like Michelle mentioned, all of those opportunities and, and there's also like national um, environmental justice calls that EPA does where it could be raised in, I think, any any forum. Because the thing that's really annoying to me is that when we're raising EJ issues in the community right now, we're being told, well, there's money, you know, why don't you apply for that grant? And it's like, that's not actually the solution to the EJ issues because it's not necessarily accessible to us and it's not a guaranteed thing. So it's not a, grants should not be a justification to put off doing right by community. It, you know, it's, it's not a solution. It's, it's a tool, but it, you know, so anyway, um, uh, is there any final comments, questions? I hope, um, I hope everybody found some useful information here, hopefully some new applicants to diverse city fund and some folks who are going to look for partners on community change. And we welcome you to let us know about additional topics that would be useful. Um, you know, um, maybe uh, we can work with Michelle and Bridgette on, you know, some uh, more in depth, you know, how do you go about uh, writing a grant? You know, what are some of the key components of talking about your work? Um, what are some of the things that funders are looking for? Um, some of the financial stuff, I think, is also, it's really important. Um, you know, again, like I said, we've learned over time, right? And with the federal grants, they require you to have timesheets and you have to justify every penny, like you got to show who got paid and what they got paid and by, you know, what exact percentage of time it was and, you know, have the backup and all of that. So anyway, we've been, it's been a learning curve for us as well. Um, I will say, Parisa, one of the things we're going to be working on um, as we move later into the summer is um, a series of webinars that do talk about some of those specific grant things. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out what, which topics make the most sense, but to do a couple that are more focused. And I know we're gonna do one that talks specifically about how do you evaluate an RFP or a notice when it comes out to make sure that it's the right fit for you because uh, mm -hmm. there's worse than writing and then being like, oh crap, this isn't really gonna work. Um, so I know we're going to do one focused on that, and I think one of them is going to be uh, focused on developing a budget. Uh, we're still working on figuring out what the other ones are going to be yet, but that is a series of webinars we'll be coming out with. Um, I would say the first one will be out probably late summer, and we're going to be pushing those out um, through Tic Tac as well as some other ways. Great. So my last comment is, again, this intake survey, if you haven't done it, if you're not sure you should do it, I would err on the side of just going ahead and filling it out. I don't think it will take you very long. And I'd rather you be in the system so that, you know, you can get notifications. And even if they'd say, oh, you're not, you know, eligible for Tic Tac, you'll still be on their list. And you know, maybe get um, information about future opportunities. They're trying to screen and make sure that the groups are actual EJ groups. That's basically the screening, you know, is to say, okay, no, this is not a national um, org with no grassroots, you know, or this is not, you know, a group that's traditional environmental, but not EJ, you know, that's, that's what they're doing. Okay, wonderful. Well, I appreciate you all so much. Um, thank you again, Michelle and Bridgette, and for all of the great work you all are doing. Everybody on the call, I um, hope to see you again soon in, in our, our next iteration of, of our work together. I hope you enjoy your weekend and um, I'll talk to you real soon. Bye. Thank Hi. you. Everyone. Thank Bye. you all. Thank, thank you, Parisa. Thanks, Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Good everyone. To see you, Robert, as Bye. well. Bye. Nice Bye. seeing you, Shana. Nice seeing you, Parisa. Yes, you too, eh? Talk to you we'll soon. Talk. Yeah, okay. we'll talk.